Really liking how these are turning out. Got kind of smooth, like furniture. Welcome back to our ICF Mountain Home Build. And today we are going to be sharing with you guys how we are going to stain our pine doors. There's not a lot out there on how to stain pine. And we have tried many different techniques and we found one that kind of sort of works uh, for pine doors. We're gonna share that with you today. All right, the last nine doors and frames are sanded. We decided we're gonna hang the frames before we stain and seal because it's easier for Jamie so we don't have to flip it over on sawhorses. So while she's staining doors, I can be hanging these frames and then she can move on to the frames and then I can poly the doors. We've got a couple sets of sawhorses here, sawhorses here. We should be able to do at least three doors at a time. We've learned a lot after having done this a few times. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this 3-0. These are all ready sanded. I'm gonna tack rag them, drill them for pins. These are for a bedroom closet. Okay, the doors are set up on the saw horses. I didn't show this part in previous videos. I'm assuming most people know this, but uh, for those who don't, this is how we set these up to do the stain so that we don't have to touch it and wait for it to dry before we flip them. I got my little toolkit put together here. This is my hanging doors toolkit, which has become pretty handy. And I've got, uh, let's see, I've got a bunch of pins that are cutoffs <laughs> from an old cattle panel. Why did I save them? I don't know, but they look like they'd be useful one day, so I saved them. And I need four for each door, so there we go. And we just, I come in about three inches on this bottom rail, and center it, and just drill a hole. Now you got little handles that you can rotisserie your door with. All right, ready to stain, then flip, then stain. And uh, I'm gonna let Jamie do this. I'm gonna get the rest of these frames where they need to be. Maybe start hanging frames. Oh, I gotta cut some. Uh, these are the pieces of wood that were attached to the doors while, for shipping. They're perfect little three quarter inch sticks, which are perfect for shimming at the hinge between the frame and the jam. So I'm gonna cut these up and I got enough shims to do all the rest of the doors. All right, so right now I am pre-staining the doors and this is really imperative when it comes to staining pine because if you do not use this pre-stain and then you end up getting blotches, uh, dark spots, you're gonna get dark spots anyway where you get the darker uh, heart of the wood, the striations in the wood, that's gonna be darker anyway where the, where the pine absorbs it more, but this helps even out overall your, your stain. So what I have here is a Minwax pre-stain. I'm using a sponge brush to apply this and I am using a 3M mask that pretty much filters out everything and that's pretty important, especially in, a, in an enclosed space. So I'm gonna get this mask back on and we're gonna finish all these doors and then I'm gonna take you to the next step. Okay, now we flip using our little pins. And we make sure as we're rotating, we're not gonna hit the sawhorse with the, with the door anywhere. Get that all nice. Uh, 
Okay, pre-staining is done. You, you generally want to start staining within 15, 20 minutes after your pre-stain. Otherwise it soaks in and sort of evaporates, but it acts kind of like a mineral spirits and uh, helps, like Jamie said, to prevent blotching. This we're using, the stain is a, a espresso color. This is oil-based Minwax, just standard wood stain. And then you got, if you're using oil-based, you stir it, you never shake it. Because once you get bubbles in it, it becomes a big pain. And you definitely want to stir it before you start. And if it's gonna be a while while you're staining, stir it kind of in the midstream of your workflow because the pigment solids tend to sink to the bottom. See there's a little clump on the bottom. And you will end up with a variation in the color of your project. So always stir. And just stir like in a circle or figure eight. Just kind of go slow to keep, keep it from developing bubbles. Just for the record, he stirs his coffee the same way. <laughs> I have a very specific methodology for my stirring in all things to in get life. To get the sugar in the bottom evenly distributed throughout the contents of but the But only liquid. after you add the cream. Otherwise, you end up having to stir twice and life's all about being efficient. All right, so we're about ready to get staining. I have my staining clothes on. Some of you might appreciate my old staining t-shirt. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure I wipe down these doors and make sure that there's not any pools of pre-stain on it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to have two rags. On my right hand, I'm going to go through and wipe the espresso onto the color that I want. This is gonna differ than other staining videos that you might see where they take a sponge brush or something and they put it on real thick and then they wipe it off after 15 minutes. And the reason that I just put it on with, to the level that I want is this dark wood in the pine tends to take stain really well and if you um, leave it on real thick and then wipe it off, that almost turns black. So in order to avoid that, we just wipe it on to the level that we want. And then in my left hand, I'm gonna have this uh, cleaner rag where I'm just gonna tidy up some of the drips. So that's kind of the trick when it comes to pine. Now, uh, the other thing just to note is that pine, all different woods stain differently. Pine in particular tends to, tends to turn yellow. Um, there's really no way of avoiding that. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna put on espresso and then I'm gonna put on a red mahogany stain on top of that, just a real light glaze, and that'll kind of warm up the wood a little bit. And then uh, a little bit later on, Jeremy's gonna put on poly. Poly tends to make it turn a little bit more yellow as well, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of our technique for doing doors. Just one thing to note, pine is a rather uh, inexpensive wood and it doesn't stain very well. You're gonna see variations from one stained door to the next stained door, not only just because of you know, personal error and technique, but also because the wood will stain differently depending on what tree it comes from. Um, so I personally think that's kind of cool um, because I like the variations in, in the different doors and different colors of the wood. But uh, we're gonna get started here. And one thing really important to note is that the rags that I'm using are lint-free rags. You definitely wanna make sure you're using lint-free so you don't get anything in, uh, any kind of lint or anything stuck in your, in your uh, stain. All right, let's get started. Focus. I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm rubbing this in pretty good. Then you see this dark spot. You kind of like thin that out to whatever level you want. I really like the brown color that that looks like right now, but as she said, it does tend to yellow a little bit. So it doesn't stay that brown. I'm gonna show how to do these corners real quick. Really get that sopped in there. And I dab these in the corners. See, there's a little bit of a 
blank space. Blank space. And then I go and spread that out. Normally I do that last, but I wanted to get that on video so you guys see that. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish this door. Okay, one thing I failed to mention um, is do the sides first uh, because that way it doesn't, you don't do the top and then it doesn't drip under. So it's better to do the sides and then when you flip it, you can wipe down any drips that might drip under. And then the other thing is make sure you work in the um, work with the grain whenever you're rubbing this on. And you're gonna notice too that it'll start to get a little bit blotchy as different areas even, even with the pre-stain will tend to absorb differently than others. So you can take your rag and just kind of go over those and bring those, bring those areas right back up if you have a rag that's all soppy. And that's just kind of it. So we have the uh, espresso color down on one side. We have not done the other side yet. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit this with the red mahogany. Now the reason why I didn't use the red mahogany, just the red mahogany on the doors is because it pulls too red. Um, and the reason why I don't wanna use just espresso is it's a little bit yellowy green and I wanna uh, pull out some reds, which is going to be reflected in the flooring choice that we made. Um, so I'm just gonna, this would be the equivalent of dry brushing if you are a painter. I'm just gonna um, put a little bit on my rag and just kind of really hit this real light. I'm not gonna try and darken this too much. It's just to kind of bring out a little bit of red. And just brush this on real light. And any streaks, I'm gonna wipe off. So I finished standing these three doors and I'm gonna let these dry overnight and then that's when the magic happens. Jeremy's gonna spray them with poly and the matte finish, finish is what really makes them look beautiful. So we're gonna be doing that tomorrow. In the meantime, he's gonna be hanging frames and we'll get back to you when we're ready to start uh, putting poly on. You can see after going over it with a little bit of red that it knocked down the yellow color and we got a good base tone ready for finishing with polyurethane, which we will do in a minute. Got all the remaining frames hung and stained, and Jamie just finished polyurethaning those. So frames are good. We'll let those dry while I set up to spray these doors. And while those are drying, I'm gonna put the hardware back in the frames, the hinges and strike plates. All right, got the doors outside. I'm gonna spray them outside. It's kind of a production getting it all set up and ready to go, but uh, got my gun here. Now you can spray with pretty much any kind of gun. I'm sh like I said, we're shooting uh, oil-based polyurethane, satin finish. Um, this has been used probably uh, about a week ago. I just set the tip in a little cup of mineral spirits keep it from clogging up after I clean it off. Um, got your gauge, and I put a water trap, moisture trap on it. And so you can see, you can leave poly in it as long as you keep it sealed for a few days. I'm filtering. I'm 
because I've got this capped and I stirred it already, but it's got some, you can see where it's just a little crusties in there. I've just stirred it, but put the pour spout on, doesn't really 100% seal it, so it starts to cure a little bit if you let it sit too long. And I don't want little plastic crusties in my spray gun, so we're gonna filter it. This takes a little bit of a trick because I've got two hands and I need four. Now, one full cup will do about three sides of doors, I figured. So I'm gonna have to refill this again once I flip the doors over to do the other side. But that works good to strain your material. Don't, I wouldn't store this long term with these spouts on it. And, and these aren't even really made for oil-based material, but since we're going through it so quickly, it's not a big deal if it sits for a day or two. But long term, put the actual lid back on it. Now we're using, as I said, uh, Minwax oil-based polyurethane satin finish. The only bad thing about this stuff is it does tend to yellow over time if it's in sun. But the good thing is it, has, it wears really well versus like a water-based poly, so it's a trade-off. And uh, if we have too much yellowing, I'm gonna try some dyes in, the, uh, in a top coat and see if that does anything, but we'll see how it works. I mean, so far it's been okay. Well, that didn't last long before that piece of rain, patch of rain's coming. So I felt a couple drops and then it was like scrambling to get everything back inside. It looks like it's like a one square mile and it, I can't tell if it's gonna hit us or not, but the temperature just dropped like 20 degrees, got windy. You can see it raining over there and it's trying to make its way over here. So I ain't taking any chances. We gotta go to town and get more poly anyway. Yep, there it goes, starting to rain. Guess we're not doing that today. Okay, take two. It's the next day, rained all day yesterday. And today it's 90 degrees, about 80% humidity. I'm gonna try and knock this out, get these back in the house where it's humidity controlled, air conditioned. Let's get it done. Okay, first coat's done. They're gonna sit out there for an hour and dry a little bit. It's super hot. The humidity is not helping, but uh, hopefully they'll get dried enough so we can start sanding. First coat, always sand the first coat, gets all the little bumps off, the little, uh, any imperfections, and gives you a nice glossy smooth surface so that when you put your final coat on, ends up looking like furniture. So that's what we're gonna do in about an hour. In the meantime, I'm gonna start uh, putting all the hardware, hinges, strike plates and everything back on all the frames that Jamie finished yesterday. So we'll be ready to start hanging these doors that we're painting now, or finishing now tomorrow. And uh, while we're doing that, I'll be able to set up for her to start staining these. So leapfrog, probably two more days will be finished, and I think we'll be able to start on our next phase, finally. Whew. So this is the laundry closet where our washer and dryer will go. And this is going to be a double 
3-0. So it has a six foot wide opening with two three foot wide doors. There are doubles that open out. So you got hinges on each side. So you can't really hang the hinge side and then hang the frame around the door like you would a normal single door like this one here. So we would, uh, when we hung that, we put the hinges on, we hung the door to the hinge side, and then we hung the rest of the frame around the door once we had the door, you know, plumb and level and all that, which is super easy. And you can get your gaps and your reveals just nice as you go. Can't really do that with these double doors. You gotta hang the frame and basically be dead on. So I take a measurement from that corner to that corner, and then I make sure I have that same measurement at each hinge the whole way down. Basically shim and nail, and we're gonna hope that everything fits. Now remember, the only whip place these are attached are at the hinges right now. These are my shims. Got that nailed on each side, filled with putty, and we stained and polyed over it. And if you recall, we marked the uh, mortise with the number for the hinge type. So here are the hinge types. If you remember in the last video, I was talking about these thingies, the number of thingies. I've been told now that these are called knuckles or barrels. Um, so this one has two, these have three. So the corresponding side that goes on the door will have two and three, so they all fit together. But they're different for each side. So I write down the number of these knuckles, barrel thingies on there so I know which goes where when we're done. And hopefully you can see it, yeah, it says two. So I know that this side takes two knuckle hinge leaves. So I'm gonna put these on. And the other thing, as I mentioned before, that center screw is going to be a three inch construction screw in each mortise. That uh, secures the entire frame to the framing of the house. So you don't just have this whole assembly, which is very heavy, just kind of pinned into the opening. There, the whole thing is screwed in through the center hole. All right, so we're gonna do that now. All right, the catches are on, strike plates for the ball catch, the hinges are on. Those are the three barrels. These are the two barrels. And that's how you do your jam. All right, we are using Schlage handles and lock sets throughout the entire house, oil rubbed bronze. We really like them. And we ran into an issue uh, with the lock sets that are on the exterior doors where they, whoop. Hang on. They're like chipping and peeling. We haven't been on there very long at all. And so they shouldn't be doing that. So we wrote to their customer service. And they just sent us all this stuff. So Schlage is a good company. They stand behind what they sell and they honor their warranty. So there's a lot of stuff in this box. That is a keypad for the, the basement. Couple handle sets, the, the big part for the front and back doors. Dead bolts, security sets for, I don't know. I don't even know if we have those. They just sent us a big bunch of stuff. So they definitely stand behind their products. Um, I like, I like Schlage. Okay, now I'm at one of the real tedious parts, and that is sanding the first coat. These, <laughs> the doors were outside. I got finished spraying the first coat, and man, it started pouring down rain. I had to hurry up and throw plastic over it. 
fortunately, the poly had dried enough to where it beaded up, and I got it in here and got uh, everything cleaned off and dried up before like any warping or bubbling happened. But I've managed to finish this door with the first sanding, the, or, I mean the sanding of the first coat. So I go over this with a uh, 220, just real light on the parts that really need it where there are like little like bumps, any high spots. And then I go over it with a sanding sponge that's like 400. And the goal is to get it just smooth as possible, which is counterintuitive because you spray that coat on and it looks nice. It seems to look nice, but it actually is really bumpy. And you want to get it down to where it's just smooth as glass because your final top coat will shoot over that and then it ends up looking like furniture. So I've already done that one so you can see how dull it is in the light. These two I haven't done yet. But let me see if you can see any detail where, see those little bumps? Those all need to come out. So that's what this sanding process does. It's, it's more tedious, takes more time, but the end result is well worth it. So I'm gonna do this and then probably end up finishing the poly tomorrow. It's almost five o'clock, it's Friday, it's Miller time. So that about wraps it up for our secrets to creating beautiful stained pine doors. Um, so just to sum it up, what you're gonna wanna do is make sure your doors are completely acclimated, make sure they're nice and sanded. You're gonna wanna use a conditioner on the wood and then within 15 minutes, apply your stain. Um, instead of applying it with a sponge brush or a bristle, bristle brush, you're gonna wanna use a lint-free rag. Bring up the color, don't put on a thick layer and then wipe it off. That'll help prevent these really big dark streaks. And make sure you have a clean rag in your other hand and clean up any streaks or spots or anything like that right away. And also feel free to mix colors if you don't find the color off the shelf that you want. Like we said earlier, we're using an espresso with a red mahogany glaze because either color by itself just wasn't quite right. We like the combination. Overall, I'm very happy with this. It took a lot of trial and error to uh, stain a rustic pine door to get that look. And uh, so we're passing that on to you. All right, so if you guys have any experience with staining pine doors, go ahead and leave those in the comments down below. We're not experts, of course, but we do share with you guys what works for us. If you guys are interested in seeing how this house all comes together, feel free to continue watching our series on our ICF Mountain Home Build. Playlist. There's like 80-some episodes in it. Check it out. See you in the next episode. Thanks for watching. See you guys. Like Bane or Darth Vader? Or a doctor. Or a doctor. A door doctor. Door doctor.